Okay, so I suppose uh, I'll start. So I welcome you to the session on uh, live session on problem solving and uh, interaction uh, for the course experimental stress analysis. I'll just uh, run you through the brief of what this session is about. Essentially, I'll be solving some uh, problems from the assignments of previous year for the same course. And uh, we will take the doubts as they come by, if any. And uh, if I'm not able to address your doubts currently, I'll take a note of them and I'll try to address it in the next session. So the idea is to have these sessions weekly once. So the timing is fixed. It is uh, on Mondays every week for this entire duration of this course. It will start on at 6 o'clock and end by 8 p.m. So whatever doubts that you have, uh, I would encourage you, if there are any, you can collate it and uh, perhaps ask it here. Or uh, I'm sure you're aware that uh, the Swayam portal has a forum, discussion forum for asking questions. So I would encourage you to join that forum as well. You can just enroll into that. And if you don't want to get updates on every mail, you can perhaps go for a digest and uh, it will send you a condensed version of that. The idea behind that is that uh, even if uh, you don't have certain doubts and if other students are having doubts and they are getting addressed by the TAs there, at least you'll get a copy of that and perhaps it will lead to a better learning experience. So I would encourage you to ask as many doubts as possible in the forum. And I'm also having a look at the forum. So whatever questions that are coming up there, I will try to address them in these live sessions. So are there any questions prior to where we start? The topic of discussion today would be the contents of week one, which is very uh, fundamental and it's an overview of experimental stress analysis and what this is all about. So we will just take up questions and we will discuss it as they come through. So before that, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ganesh Ramaswamy. I'm a PhD scholar. I'm working with Professor uh, K. Ramesh, who is offering this course in NPTEL. And my co-guide is Professor U. Saronan from the Civil Engineering Department. I'm working in the Department of Applied Mechanics at IIT Madras. So again, I extend my warm welcome to all of you. And if there are any questions about this session or any other thing, I would like to take it now. Then we can get started with solving some, looking at some problems. So if there are any questions, I would encourage you unmute and perhaps ask. And even while solving the questions, if midway there are any questions, you please feel free to unmute and ask. And if it gets too much clustered, then we can go with chat box or something like that. OK, so I take it that there are no questions. So we'll get started with the first question here. I hope all of you have seen the lectures that are uploaded in the Swam portal. Announcement section says that there was only there were one more session on 4th Feb. For this course, you're saying? For the experimental stress analysis course, you're saying? Mr. Uh, no, that is unlikely. Actually, per course, only one TA has been assigned for this PMRF duty. And uh, the experimental stress analysis course offered by Professor Ramesh, I am handling it. So this is the first session to start with. How do, how do the fringe changes according to the, okay. Mr. Atharva, we'll take up that question as we go along. I'll try to address that, how the fringe changes. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Raphael, I'm afraid I don't think there was, a, you please check again if there was a session for it, if it meant for this course, but as such, today is the first session we are starting. Before that, uh, no sessions have been done for this course. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Anything else? Okay. So let's get started with this. So the first question asks that the light rays, yeah, okay. So you're giving the answer, that's fine. So the light rays form an envelope after reflected or refracted by a curved surface or an object. 
this property is efficiently utilized in which of the following techniques so the question is either whether it is to do with caustics photoelasticity moire interferometry or holography so essentially even in the overview of the course if you see the it starts with a t cup so what happens is when you have a curved surface and light impinges on it so essentially it will all get concentrated onto some specific points either it could be divergent or convergent depending on how the deformation is the example shown in the yeah the example shown in that lecture is actually a curved surface of a cup but uh, the, well, since this is observed the idea is to exploit this physics in order to understand patterns from a uh, stress analysis point of view so if we were to see any uh, uh, specimen so to speak and if we apply that with the load and it deforms that deformation if we impinge light on it it will give you some kind of patterns so this convergent or divergent behavior essentially happens due to poisson's effect near stress concentration zones so this we have effectively tried to utilize that in the form of caustics so the idea behind this is to find out which are the if let us say you have a body a model or a component which is being stressed and if you were to impinge light and if you notice that the certain patterns get formed because of the specimen behaving like a convergent or divergent lens at the stress concentration zone because we know that when the high stresses occur accordingly poisson's ratio will lead to either a dimple formation or a bulging out so that is essentially utilized in order to find out what the stress concentration zones are so that is the phenomena behind caustics so essentially caustics is the, uh, the, the this property is essentially utilized in the experimental technique of caustics which uh, in a, in a way which helps you identify large stress concentration zones that is the idea behind it so are there any questions at this point and uh, bear in mind that uh, if i am not able to do justice to your doubts right now i will definitely take note of them and rest assured that i will definitely try to clarify them to the best of my abilities at least by the next next session and uh, in the meantime even after this session i will be uploading this video to youtube and uh, the this pdf where i am working it out this also will be made available and this will be subsequently uploaded to uh, yeah i'll just answer one minute uh, we, this will be subsequently uploaded to the swayam page itself on the bottom right you will be they'll up, upload it soon so you will be seeing a link called live sessions from where you can access these and if you have any questions based on rewatching these also you are welcome to ask so yeah regarding the questions civilly deformed professor said that caustics use yes so essentially if you see let us take a body and uh, if i have let us say a crack like that i have enlarged it uh, so as to make the point clear but essentially at this point in the plane of the body the stress concentration is very very high it will shoot up so essentially sigma x and sigma y are very very high if i take this to be in the xy plane so that being the case even if if let us say it was a thin plate so essentially it is in plane stress so what would happen is stress as sigma z would be zero but can the same be said about the strains strains would definitely be there if it is a plane stress condition uh, definitely strains would be there because of poisson's effect so if you were to see the quantity in the bracket shoots up almost 30% of it is delivered to the out of plane taking poisson's ratio to be roughly 0.3 in such a case there would be a dimple formation at this point so if i were to draw a cross section here i would see that essentially it would have gone in like that at the crack tip because of this poisson's effect so if i were to impinge light on it it would naturally behave like a divergent or convergent lens 
so that is the idea behind caustics which we are trying to uh, exploit so if uh, in a, in in such a cases all right so in such a cases if we were to find out where the stress concentration points are this gives us a via media to identify that i hope i answered your question mr rafael okay any other questions how can we get the counter by contour you i suppose you mean by experimental methods how can we get the contours by experimental methods okay i would uh, suggest that you just wait through this session as we go along with the questions i'll try to explain uh, what all physical principles are involved in uh, some of the methods so naturally you will see how they get formed before that uh, i would just like a brief uh, slight digression i would just like to know what is it that you understand by contour yes mr rajamannar yes sir yeah any other yeah any curved surface if you were to even a lens if you see lens has a curved surface so if you were to impinge if it is reflective and if you were to impinge naturally it will converge at one point from application stress analysis point of view if you see at a crack tip there is stress concentration or if you take a disc let us say and subject it to a point load at this point if you see in an experiment when you apply the compression there you would be able to see a slight dimple formation at these points if you see it from the side you will be able to see that it has bulged out why because sigma y essentially is very very high sigma x and uh, the poisson's effect is causing it to bulge out so this will cause it to form a dimple this will cause it to bulge out so yes yeah the liquid that is present is uh, the idea is to have a film it could be a photographic film instead of a liquid film the uh, the patterns which you are seeing is on the top surface of the liquid which is visible if you were to have a reflective coating there and no liquid inside still you would be able to see a pattern because the light phenomena is what is causing this no the phenomena has to do with the surface light that is impinging on the surface of the cup the content of the cup is uh, uh, yes so the content of the cup is not under the question here the phenomena what professor was trying to explain is since it is curved the light is impinging on it and it is forming that silver line that cusp is getting formed on the top surface of that liquid if it were not a liquid present in the cup and if it were some reflective surface at the same level you would be seeing this essentially the same thing yeah yeah yes okay before that i would just like to what is it that you mean by contours can anyone take a shot at this because understandably everyone might not be uh, if everyone is aware of that that is well and good but as we go along because we will be constantly bombarded with figures which are showing some pattern so the idea is to identify what those mean before that a very fundamental question is what is it that we understand by contour uh it needs to be vertical and horizontal only okay
ఓకే కలర్ ఫార్మేషన్ డ్యూ టు అప్లైడ్ లోడ్ ఎనీ అదర్ ఓకే థ్యాంక్ యూ ఓకే ఎసెన్షియలీ కాంటోర్స్ ఆర్ నథింగ్ బట్ ఇఫ్ యూ సీ ఎనీ ఎనీ ఫీల్డ్ ఫీల్డ్ వేరియబుల్ మీన్స్ ఇన్ త్రీ డైమెన్షన్స్ వీ హ్యావ్ త్రీ కోఆర్డినేట్స్ X, Y, and Z, let us say, if we take the basis to be orthoparpendicular, stress value should be same on the contour. Yes, essentially, stress value should be the same on the contour. So, you mean about a stress contour. What I mean to say is, if there were some parameter P, let us say, which is a function of X, Y, Z, and maybe other things also, which could be, spatially, it is dependent on this thing. let us say it also depends on time now if you were to time if you were to hold time constant and if you were to vary x y and z this p will have certain value at every point in space now if p is a scalar uh, scalar field then it would just be a number at every field at every point if it is a vector field then at every point depending on x y and z it will be a vector pointing somewhere in space now the idea of a contour is if we were to plot this p as a function of x y and z what we would be seeing is a essentially a three dimensional surface and if we were to have the parameter time included into it the surface would be changing with time if it is a time varying phenomena now essentially what we are trying to do contour is essentially a projection of that onto a plane now if we say this is a contour then what we essentially mean is there is some p parameter that we are trying to check and these lines indicate where the uh, value of that p is constant it is same along that line so this gives a quick representation for us to understand uh, stress field displacement fields or uh, there are many other uh, parameters temperature field thermal field so whatever parameter that we are trying to study essentially we are trying to plot contours either plot or by experimental methods we ourselves we sometimes get contours so the idea is to analyze how the pa parameter variation is across space so that is the idea behind a contour as uh, mr rafael correctly said it represents that the stress value should be same at every point so that is called a stress contour so essentially if we have contours of principal stress difference let us say principal stresses we denote by sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3 and bear in mind that throughout this course we will be following the convention to name it this way this is very important please keep this in mind that uh, sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3 are labeled this way such that it is in the decreasing order algebraically so if we were to have a negative let us say if sigma 1 was 40 and sigma uh, if one of the principal stresses was 40 and the, yeah and the other one was let us say minus 40 so essentially if sigma if the other third uh, principal stress is zero then how we would put it is this way it is quite important to understand this in such a case photoelasticity gives us if we are considering the other plane out of plane this thing to be zero then sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is what we are seeing as the principal stress difference in the plane of the domain so sigma 1 minus sigma 2 equal to some constant k this is what is the uh, these are the fringes that we get from the method called photoelasticity so like this any uh, other experimental method which is whole field can give you values uh, and if we were to plot them or if we were to observe them in a particular fashion ideally these represent some contours and contours mean that the parameter value is same along that line and this will also give a sense of how the gradient is that is if we were to just as an example if i were to say that if we were to have a disk under diametral compression for which the contours we will be seeing essentially it will be like this i'm not drawing all of them but uh, near the load application point it would be something like this so now we are able to see that the contours become closer and closer to each other so essentially the gradient is very very high if the gradient is very high or very low 
uh, if the gradient is very high, it indicates that we are moving towards a stress concentration point. So these are some of the fundamentals that we can just keep in mind while we explore. Okay, so yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll come to that. I understood uh, what you are trying to ask, uh, how we get it. Essentially, it is an optical arrangement. Uh, yeah, before that, let me also tell you what point by point and whole field is. Some methods are point by point and some are whole field. Anybody wants to take a shot at what these two mean? Based on what we discussed for a parameter, P, let us say, so a point by point technique versus a whole field technique. Could anybody differentiate between the two? Staying is exactly. So uh, essentially these measure, measure that parameter P. That parameter P will be stress, will be displacement, whatever that be. Yes. Yeah at a point yes depending on how we probe it if we were to take a strain gauge for example as he said uh, it is a point by point technique at one point it gives a strain there is another uh, addition to it it at one point it doesn't give us just the strain it gives a component of the strain tensor so that is also very important to remember whereas a whole field technique most of point at certain points, whole field has the ability P from experiment by some way. Yes, exactly. So a whole field technique gives you throughout the domain. Yeah. So uh, another way to say it mathematically is throughout the domain of interest, because essentially we are trying to uh, solve, a, a, we are trying to capture the essence mathematically for extrapolation. So th throughout the domain, if we are able to see the uh, parameter, yeah, so essentially it's a whole field technique. By point by point, if we mean, uh, then it only gives us at particular points where we probe it. So that is the idea. So most optical techniques, if you see, are whole field. Whereas if we were to go for strain gauges, even if caustics, if we were to take, essentially it could be optics, but the effect only take place takes place at point by point. So we would classify that. Of course, these classifications are a little arbitrary, but uh, on a broader scale, if we see caustics only gives us stress concentration point information. So that can be classified as a point by point technique. And uh, yeah, I will come to your question, Atharva, as we move along, uh, because we have some time. So as we move along with the questions, uh, possibly it will answer how we get the fringes and if it doesn't then you can take up the question so let us move on to the next question which among the following figures represents the variation of shear stress over the cross section of a beam having rectangular section subjected to three point loading according to the available analytical solutions from strength of materials so what the question essentially says is let us say we have a beam let me draw a beam Sorry. So we have a beam. Let us say that it is simply supported. And uh, I have a point load applied P. A as far as I can remember. Okay. So please share your phone number at the end of the meeting. Okay. If need be, that I'll share. But anyway, if you have something to ask over the phone, you may as well bring it up now or in the next session, or you can also ask it in the forum. But I have no inhibitions against sharing, that's fine. So if we were to see how is the shear force diagram like for this beam? Yeah, before that I should clarify the sign convention that we are using. Let us say that we go with the Crandall sign convention. So positive shear let us say I write like this. So essentially, my shear force diagram is like that. And my bending moment diagram is just a triangle. 
okay so at this point at the point where the load is applied what is the shear force anyone minus p so this is minus plus this is p this is also p at the point of application essentially it is indeterminate because if we see shear forces nothing but slope of the bending moment diagram so if you see there is a sharp corner in the bending moment diagram here there are two slopes so it cannot be multi valued hence it is indeterminate so we can only speak in relative terms so if we were to see uh, what our strength of material solution says is tau is nothing but vq by ib q is nothing but the first moment of area i is the second moment of area so the moment of inertia d is the width of the beam that is out of the plane and v v is essentially p here if we were to take some section absolute value of p we can take because here it it depends on the sign convention on what is positive what is negative so essentially if you see for design problems we will not worry much about the sign of the shear force rather than the magnitude so that is what counts so essentially if we see by this formulation we will be able to see that shear force along the depth of the beam it will come out to be tau xy will be will be some uh, it will be proportional to y squared so essentially it is a parabolic variation but is this true at every section is the point behind this question from strength of material what it says is uh, vq by ib we have derived but whether this still holds is the question that we have to ask so the idea is if we were to take our saint venans principle and take a section that is far away from the load application point here there is a load applied and then here there will be a reaction applied so essentially if we were to take a section somewhere in the middle that is sufficiently far away from this load application points this kind of variation is indeed uh, it is also experimentally seen that it is more or less a parabola but if we were to move somewhere near the load application point we would essentially notice that it is no longer a parabola but the stress concentration moves uh, near and near to the load application point and the maximum shear stress point of maximum shear stress for this example the point of maximum shear stress is at the neutral axis essentially that is what this figure says that the maximum shear stress is at the middle and for a rectangular section we know the shape factor comes out to be 1.5 times of the average shear stress but if we move, move closer and closer to the load application point this variation will no longer hold so it will be something something to that effect so it will keep on increasing as we move towards the load application point which can be seen experimentally so we will look at some fringes maybe if not in this session maybe in the next session i'll try to show you and i suppose it is also covered in the lecture you can just have a look i missed why it would be proportional vq by ib if you see uh for a beam with d and this being the depth let us say y varies this way this is h by 2 this is h by 2 this is the cross section of the beam so if you were to calculate tau it is vq by ib i for this section is bh cube by 12 v is nothing but the shear force which we saw from our example is nothing but capital p and i meant to say that we are either this section or that section it depends on the sign convention so it is a matter of stress uh, just the reversal so we are dealing with the absolute value as of now q if we were to take here if i take a small strip here at a distance y so what will q be for that for that small strip it will be y b y is the area and uh, b d y is the area and this is the lever arm because q is essentially first moment of area so if i were to integrate this between h by 2 uh, between 0 and h by 
invoking symmetry because if I were to do it from minus h by 2 to h by 2, you would see that it will come out to be 0. So essentially, if you were to integrate this, this will be by squared uh, with some limits. So that is why it is a function of y squared. So you would see that it is a parabolic variation. I hope it is clear. And this is anyway covered in detail in your strength of materials. So you can always refer back to that if there is any question. Yeah, OK. OK, so the yes, the basic idea behind this question is not to just brush up on what you learned in strength of material, but to identify that there are certain approximations that we have made. And uh, we should be cautious while we apply them to field problems. For example, if you were to design a beam, well, I'm from a civil engineering background, so I'll explain with an example. Mechanical engineering also beams are very much prevalent. So if you were to take a beam which is having three point bending, you should know that the stress variation is parabolic only at sections that is away from the load application point. Whereas at the load application point, shear will shoot up and it will be very high. It will be comparable to the bending stresses in fact. We can no longer say that shear effects can be neglected. So at that point, some kind of reinforcement needs to be provided in case we are going for a three point bending. That is the idea. So we need to keep in mind uh, of the assumptions that we have made. So let us move on to the next problem, uh, next question. The physical phenomena exploited by a photoelastic te experimental technique to reveal stress information is interference, stressed induced by reference, caustics or diffraction. So essentially, let me just give a brief about photoelasticity. Anyway, this course will deal with this methodology in much more detail. Uh, in the weeks to come, we will be dealing with this in much more detail. So the idea is, uh, if we see a crystal, a crystal has a property of birefringence. Birefringence essentially means that there are two refractive indices. So if you were to pass a light ray, it will not just get refracted into one light ray, but it will get refracted into two light rays. So that is what is clearly seen if we in in a class also during the lecture also when we start off with the transmission photoelasticity part, uh, we can see that a word that is written and we were to put a crystal over it and observe, we will be able to see two of those words. That is the property of birefringence, which is inherent to crystals. Whereas what what is surprising is certain class of materials in when you when they are stress free they just behave as uh, normal materials but if we were to stress that then at each and every point the it has something called a stressed induced by reference it starts behaving like a crystal when it is stressed so what will happen if you impinge a light over it it will get refracted into two rays two refracted rays so this is the physical principle that we are trying to exploit now how can we exploit that when we have a controlled light setting and we know what is the light that we are impinging on the model. Whatever is the output is the change in the input and the output will only be caused by the model. So essentially that is what we study. So in photoelasticity, every point in the model domain when it is stressed undergoes a phenomenon called stressed induced by reference because of which it will introduce certain uh, optical interference which will be showing in form of color, colorful fringe patterns. Those colors and those fringe patterns essentially convey something, convey the stress information. Essentially, those are nothing but sigma 1 minus sigma 2, So, say, which is in the plane of the model. So essentially, stressed induced by reference is the basic, tenet, uh, basic uh, phenomenon, which is uh, the backbone of the method called photoelasticity. And again, this is a whole field technique because at once, if we take a photo elastic material and we load it, uh, we will be able to see at once, we will be able to see the stress variation across the domain. Stress variation in the sense, we will be able to see constant principal stress difference contours. So I hope this is clear. If there are any questions, please do ask. Uh, by reference, yes. So, yeah.
fringe is a okay contour you can also plot essentially fringe is something where light there are two mechanical waves let us say that there are two mechanical waves now if i were to add these two like this what will i get i'll get no response i'll get black line uh, i'll get a line that's all because the positive cancels with the negative so essentially this output if there are light rays which is retarded by this amount there are two light rays which are interfering destructively then i'll be seeing no color there no light there it will be dark whereas at other points if we, if it were to uh, uh, interfere constructively i'll be seeing the brighter spots and in between them there will be a variation so essentially what if i were to apply this to the whole model i'll be seeing bands of black and white those things are called fringes though the, that is an optical phenomena now what we know from photoelasticity theory is that those fringes are nothing but representation of a contour of constant principal stress difference if there is a fringe that implies that all the points on that fringe on that black or colored fringe have the same value of sigma 1 minus sigma 2 that could be any k let us say k1 if we move on to the next fringe it will be having some k2 in between it will be having some kn kx which is varying as a function of space i hope that is clear yeah it it will increase it will increase if we increase the load naturally fringe numbers will increase see yes if we increase the load sigma 1 also increases sigma 2 also increases so naturally the difference also increases by some amount so there will be more fringes that will come in yes that also yes it will be uh, changing automatically yeah 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 okay. yeah so i will take the questions from mr rafael uh, will the physics of the bidirectional fringe phenomena be considered in detail it will be considered to the extent it is applicable for stress analysis we will not be going uh, the professor will cover it in detail how the retardation takes place uh but uh, to go into thorough optics of it and what leads to birefringence and uh, how optical elements are made those are only touched upon but uh, those are covered in uh, courses on physics and optics Th those also you can refer if you are interested the idea behind this is our uh, motive is here is to understand uh, stress information so stress analysis as the name suggests we want to know if we were to load something how the stress gets formed behind that there is an optical technique let us say called photoelasticity now the idea is at least we should be familiar with the fundamentals of this technique as to what leads to uh, this phenomena so it is it will be covered to the extent that it is needed for uh, thorough understanding of this course but beyond that they actually sky is the limit you could be uh, for each and every optical element itself you could do a thorough research which will be involving many courses in physics so if you are interested definitely uh, you can explore that i hope uh, that is clear sigma 1 minus sigma 2 will be decreased uh in what context sigma 1 minus sigma 2 will decrease no if we apply load essentially at every point stress is increasing so the difference is increasing by some amount some other amount so essentially if i were to take uh, let us say a four point bend and then i bend we know that uh, what is sigma in case of a four point bend beam sigma x is given by m by i into y so we know this so if i were to increase what if i were to increase the load on that four point bending beam what is it that i am essentially increasing i am increasing the bending moment that is being applied this m is nothing but t into some e t being the load applied so essentially i am increasing m so naturally sigma x will also increase so the stresses keep on increasing 
sigma 1 minus sigma 2 decrease. This was trying to answer the question. It's not a question. We can go further. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. I hope that is clear then. So I'll go further. We'll go on to the next problem. So shearography is a popular experimental technique which can provide the direct information of in-plane displacements, stress components, slopes and curvature, principal stress directions. Uh, this has been discussed in the lecture. Yeah, so essentially slopes and curvature. So if you see that for space applications, as professor also mentions in the lecture, these are widely used. Why? Uh, because if we were to use a laminate or a, a honeycomb structure, we should see to it that the lam there is no delamination that is taking place. So essentially, well, what that slope indicates is it is the slope of the out of plane displacement. If let us say there is a film and there is a debonding occurring, so it will show some kind of pattern that is specific to that area which represents that the slope is non-zero, which implies that there is some delamination that has taken place. So the idea is to measure that. So that is what shearography is used for. And uh, to, in order to ca ca thoroughly cover this methodology in detail, uh, I would suggest that uh, perhaps I could give a more detailed explanation on shearography, holography, starting in the next class, uh, next session if uh, it is needed. But essentially, the idea behind this overview is to familiarize yourself with what are the methods that are currently present, what are the methods that are coming up. For example, digital image correlation is a comparatively newer method as compared to these other ones that we discussed. So what, how essentially once we identify the physics behind a phenomena, how we try to exploit that to coin some method uh, in order to carry the stress analysis for components. So in that respect, holography is one 3D uh, photo, uh, essentially it's a 3D photography as compared to 2D. So there are many variations of holography, for example, speckle interferometry and then shearography is another variation of that. All these is just trying to manipulate the optical arrangements and to make it more uh, palatable to uh, general stress analysis rather than having very high tech equipments because it is not uh, always possible for, uh, for not possible and also not needed for certain class of problems. You don't need very ultra high precision. So in such cases, uh, you might uh, go on with a lesser variant of the same method. So I hope that is clear. So essentially, this is to measure slopes and curvature. So if you were to move on to the next question, which one of the following experimental techniques is an ideal technique that can be used to measure displacements in nano devices? So essentially, we are speaking of the scale of 10 power minus 9 meters. So naturally, one can see that, uh, anyway, uh, one can see that, first of all, it is asking for displacements. So it cannot be brittle coatings. So even if other ones measure displacement, holography is the technique. Moire also measures displacements, yes. But geometric moires, essentially, we are trying to see the interference patterns between gratings. So if we were to measure something of the order of 10 power minus 9, you can imagine the density of grating. Yeah, you can imagine the density of grating that is required for that, which is not possible to fabricate. So essentially, we deal with holography for this, such applications, very high end applications, because Holography is also very cumbersome to uh, conduct holographic experiments and it has a very stringent vibration requirement. But essentially, if we are to measure something in that scale, it happens to be the only method that can assist with that. Because it is uh, very high precision is there, provided the experiment is conducted very carefully. That's a given for anything, essentially. The experiments, only well-conducted experiments uh, can give you meaningful results. Others can, as professor also says in the lecture, can measure anything under the sky. As strain gauges are very much uh, abused uh, because uh, strain gauge pasting is a very subtle aspect and needs to be done very carefully. So there are many aspects to that. So a well-conducted experiment is where all these problems have been taken care of and uh, the results are 
reported with integrity so that is what we can take towards doing science i hope that is clear yeah so the strain tensor in case of a pure beam under pure bending is which of the following let me draw a beam let us say that uh, again this is subjected to some loading p and uh, pure bending as we know for the for this only this and this section will be having shear force this is called a shear span which doesn't have any which has a constant zero shear force so essentially bending moment will not change here so what we are speaking about is in this region what is the strain tensor like uh, before that i'll just give you a brief of what this what we mean by this tensor okay so we have one answer saying that it is b uh, essentially stresses and strains are second order tensor what they mean is second order tensor second order rank tensor essentially require in plain words actually there is more much more to it if we go deep into continuum mechanics but just to give a flavor of it what it essentially requires is a quantity a magnitude and two associated directions so at any po yeah epsilon x by poisson's ratio yes so if we were to have uh, you include the poisson's ratio everything will be in terms of epsilon x x so that we have not done we have uh, uh, remained general in that sense otherwise your question is right if we were to replace everything by epsilon x x we may as well go with one mu and mu okay so it has two associated directions essentially what it requires is if there is a if there is a point if there is a plane and at in that plane you take a point and then you applied some load so that could have one direction is the plane in on which it is applied and the other represents the direction in which the force has been applied so essentially stress strain these are second order tensor quantities essentially you should populate them in tensor form and uh, what we loosely speak of p by a for example it is discussed in the lecture also are nothing but components of stress some component that sits in the uh, stress tensor so if this were the case if we were to take the pure bending section here this pure bending section if we were to take what is sigma xx let us say this is p and uh, let us say this is 3l so it is pl by i into y this is the variation yeah A m by e m by e i e i will not come essentially we are talking about stress not about curvature so sigma xx is there is sigma yy there sigma yy is essentially zero let us say that we are dealing with a plane stress condition which is very thin case let us say sigma zz is also zero if this be the case if i take a point here and i try to draw the stress representation there yeah so we are having sigma xx sigma yy doesn't exist and uh, since uh, any point you take in the shear span there is no shear existing so essentially this itself represents your principal stresses so for this problem sigma 1 is pl by i 
into y or essentially sigma 1 is sigma xx. I am talking about the tension side. When we go to the compression side, it will go on the other end because of the negative sign. Sigma 2 is 0. Sigma 3 is 0. So, if we are to apply the generalized hook law, Hooke's law, we will be able to see that uh, stresses are only uh, unidirectional, but strains will be triaxial because of Poisson's effect essentially. So, we can say that this B is our stress tensor. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay. See, it might. Uh, we, I might be uh, actually recapitulating from the very fundamentals, which you might already know. But please bear with me. In the interest of others, also, I would request that you bear with me. As we go along, we'll take up pick up pace. So yeah, I hope this is clear. Okay. This is something to be essentially there are a lot of terminologies. If you read research papers, they will be mentioning uh, all the quantities in terms of these terminologies only. So it is essential that you as a stress analyst, you must know what these terms mean at once so that you are not running from pillar to post every time you see a new terminology. So essentially the contours of constant principle sum of principal stress difference are termed. Anyone knows the answer for this? So the contours, yeah, anyone had a, anyone has something to D, is it? Okay. Any, any other answers? Okay. Anyway, this is not some, uh, this is something to be, as you move along, you will get uh, very familiar with this because there are okay so there are certain methods which will give you uh, repeatedly it will give you one kind of information so essentially isopachics is what we call sigma 1 plus sigma 2 so these are uh, contours of constant sum principal stress difference isoclinics as the name suggests clean uh, that is clean uh, incline so essentially these are nothing but contours of constant principal stress di directions. So, uh, for example, in the case of our pure bending, we saw that the principal stress is sigma xx. So, although the quantity is changing from every point to point, the orientation still remains the same. That is, our principal stress direction is 0 and 90. 0 is the major principal stress direction and uh, 90 is the minor principal stress direction. So, if we were to see the isoclinics for this, those will be contours that are parallel, which will be all zero. So, if you were to see uh, in a plane polariscope, you would see nothing there, but it will be black. So, what it implies is that every point, the uh, principal stress direction is same, which is which happens to be zero for the case of pure bending, zero or 90, whichever be the case. Isotherms are as the name suggests, it is constant temperature. Isochromatics, this is interesting. Actually, the B and the D, these two isoclinics and isochromatics you get from photoelasticity. Yes, so chroma essentially means color. So, since the color information of photoelasticity gives us principal stress difference, we name this as constant principal stress difference. But uh, that is related to color only, which comes from the word chroma. Yeah. Difference remains the same. Yes. Yes. In isochromatics, the difference of the principal stress remains the same. 
let us take the same example of that four point bending if i were to take a point here let me mark it in red if i were to take a point here and if i were to take a point here let me call this point 1 point 2 at point 1 and point 2 is there any difference in the stress principal stresses are still sigma x which is pl by i into y so it is essentially same sigma y is zero so sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is essentially same for both these points in fact if i were to take any point at this layer at a specific y if i were to take any point it will have the same principal stress difference so from this what can we infer that for a case of pure bending logic from my analytical equations i can say that my fringe contours will be just parallel lines the colors of those lines will indicate the magnitude of the difference which happens to be varying with y but essentially the shape of the contours will be parallel only i hope that is clear similarly there is something called isothetics so isothetics are nothing but uh, contours of constant displacement yeah there was some question here d is the same color the domain where we have the same difference of stress and therefore the same color exactly domain or the point in the domain essentially because it varies from point to point uh, it so happens that in the case of pure bending it varies only along one spatial dimension which happens to be y along x it is invariant but it could vary it uh, for other problems it may well vary for with respect to x also so essentially we are dealing with a point phenomenon not a question i tried to... okay fine so let us move on to the next question in the fringe patterns obtained from photoelasticity the contours that are seen as bands and why is that so essentially yeah yeah isopatics is the answer uh, it gives you constant sum of uh, principal stresses yes and uh, isochromatics give you difference of principal stresses so can you see that with a and d if you had isopatics and isochromatics together you can see that you can add them up and trivially do stress separation so yeah so that is applied uh, actually isopatics are contours that you can get from holography and isochromatics you can get from photoelasticity so if we were to separate out the difference let us say if we were to find out sigma 1 alone sigma 2 alone so for the same specimen we need to do a uh, holography and we need to do photoelasticity with both these results we can easily do stress separation and identify principal stresses sorry yes for the same problem you will have to do you won't get it at once one will come from holography one will come from iso uh, photoelasticity but if we were uh, very much specific about separating it this is how it can be done yeah yeah so uh, in the fringe patterns ob obtained from photoelasticity the contours as seen are, uh, are are bands why we could solve for sigma yes exactly so if we were to do both we can solve for sigma 1 and sigma 2 it is not uh, necessary that you have to do holography only uh, just i'll just digress a little before i come to this problem again let us say that you have a disk again because you will see that as uh, the case of pure bending is for strength of material for theory of elasticity and stress analysis the very fundamental problem will be a disk for planar loading conditions that is what we will take time and again so if this has some thickness now when i compress this this will have some out of plane deformation also that out of plane deformation will be strain in the other direction sigma zz let us say if i call this x call this y and if i compress this sigma zz will be this let us consider this disk to be very very thin so essentially it is in plane stress so sigma zz is zero so essentially epsilon zz is nothing but minus mu sigma xx 
plus sigma yy. So you can see that sigma xx plus sigma yy is being normal, uh, some of the normal stresses we are getting here. So in cases where sigma xx and sigma yy coincide with the principal stress direction, this is another via media for you to get the sum of principal stresses. And difference of principal stresses anyway you can observe from photoelasticity. So this also leads to stress separation. Yeah. Okay. In the fringe patterns observed, uh, yeah. So actually, I I don't have a photoelastic fringe pattern with me as far as I can tell. Perhaps uh, you can refer the lecture, and I'll also try to recapitulate this in the next session where I'll get you some contours. Uh, many of them would have already seen it in the photoelastic setup. But for those who have not seen it, I will try to show it. So essentially what we see is, again if I were to take the disk, or let me not be fixated with the disk, let me take a problem of 4 point bending. And this is the shear span. If I were to just zoom into the shear span, essentially what I will be seeing is bands like this. And these bands have some thickness. These are thick. So the question that is being asked is, in the fringe patterns obtained from photoelasticity, the contours are seen as bands. Why is that? Because it matches with the analytical results, because of the material property, because of the deficiency in the recording medium. OK. Uh, Yes. Exactly. Uh, yeah, fine. You are saying that uh, it will depend on the light. Let us say uh, when whenever a problem depends on more parameters, in order to study one, we will fix the other parameter and try to vary this. In such a case, with your argument, let us fixate on one wavelength. Given one wavelength, let us say I take a, uh, some particular wavelength, x or lambda. For that wavelength of light, still what I will observe for the case of pure bending is something like this. Although for a monochromatic, uh, this is nearly accurate because for a monochromatic light source, a single wavelength light source, all the bands will be of same color. Yeah. So if that be the case, why is it that I am seeing bands? That is, it is actually speaking, uh, yeah, actually speaking at a point, at, at the center of this band, at that y, at that exact y, yeah, one minute, I will come to that question, at that exact y, the principal stress difference is constant. So essentially, I should be seeing a line, but I am not able to see that because it is so closely varying. So it is the it is our deficiency of a recording medium. If I were to zoom into this place a million times and see, I can actually see the variation in the intensity. So essentially, if I capture this image and if I keep probing into this fringe, I will see essentially one line of pixels which will have a constant color. Constant, it will be, uh, uh, it will be of the same color. It will be totally black maybe. So that essentially signifies that sigma 1 and sigma 2 is, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is constant. But if I were to zoom in, it will show me as bands. That is because of the deficiency of the recording medium. Yeah, there was a question in the, yeah. What is a band here? The field of the same color. Yes. Yeah, band essentially implies, uh, Ideally, it should be a line with a constant color intensity. Instead of a line, it's a band. So instead of a very, uh, instead of a string, you are having a rubber band, you can say, a thick rubber band, something like that is for uh, the analogy I'm trying to bring out. I hope that is clear. Yes. Yeah. Right. And why is that?
why they have given the option b because of material property uh, perhaps to make you sensitive to the fact that uh, the experimental technique and the material uh, it uh, the once an established experimental technique is there it should be uh, invariant of the material property if it acts sensitive to that then that also becomes a problem yeah ha huh. yeah yeah okay okay i see okay i see okay right right okay okay sure material we study okay yeah so i hope this is clear any other questions at this point am i uh am i going fast or am i missing out something if there are any questions you please uh, make sure to bring it up like the others are actively participating i would encourage everybody to in case you have questions please do ask all right so let us move on to the next question from the contours given below identify the fringe pattern which matches with the u displacement obtained in the case of a cantilever beam with an end load so what we are trying to see is again let me draw a beam and this is fixed and we have a load applied there d okay so we have got one answer as d the idea is to understand first of all what by what method this has been measured so we are having answers couple of them okay you see these things these essentially rep represent whenever you report some uh, fringe pattern that you obtain from moire from the method of moire you are supposed to uh, provide the direction of the grating reference grating which you had kept so essentially moire gives you displacements that are perpendicular to that grating so if you were to see by this thing uh, what is asked is u displacement that is displacement along the length of the beam in such a case our grating invariably has to be perpendicular to the length of the beam so naturally d cannot be the answer and b cannot be the answer now this begs the question which one out of a and c should i select now you know that in case of a three point uh, in case of a cantilever beam there is essentially asymmetry that is happening that is if you were to see the bending uh, bending moment how it varies you would see that it's a triangle at one end it is nothing and at the other end it is the maximum so there is some kind of symmetry that is asymmetry that is inherent to this problem in such a case can the response of u displacement be symmetric is the question we should try to address essentially if we see a shows the fringes but those are symmetric about the center line so essentially from the physics from our rudimentary understanding of the problem of a cantilever beam we can conclude that a cannot be the answer so that is why essentially c is the answer for this u displacement for uh, and these are uh, shown in the lecture also so essentially if we were to calculate uh, v displacement then i will have to keep my grating along the length of the beam which is what is shown in d so this works on the uh, this works on the principle of mechanical interference because of the grating and uh, this uh, actually i do have those gratings that professor showed in the class so i i hope you are able to see this that uh, essentially as i move this you are able to see that bands are getting formed so this is the principle behind uh, moire that is being used this could be a nuisance at times but uh, ideally speaking once we identify that this method has the potential of this interference and it is giving us some patterns how they try to exploit this is okay if i were to have a reference grating and if i were to 
paste or stick some kind of a grating on a specimen and if it were to move in an unknown direction which is what i am trying to study it will show some kind of a pattern and how experiments go about is first you will do the same thing for a known problem you will calibrate the result for a known problem what is the pattern you are observing and what is the pattern that should be there in that known problem both you know so you try to draw a correlation between the two then you try to extrapolate the same method to an unknown problem based on the calibration that you have done you try to extrapolate what are the results of this unknown problem in that respect moire is one of the methods that is used for displacement measurements i hope that is clear pa pattern is indicating uh, displacement this thing so a, a fringe that is there these are all having the same displacement is this the side view yes this is the side this is the as i have drawn it that is the view is what we are seeing this is what i have drawn so if i were to put a moire grating and study it by terms of moire this is what it means more displacement gradient yes so the closer it is the more uh, the faster it is varying is what you can say yeah if you see by some means of calibration if you see option a you can see here that these have been labeled as 0.5 0.5 of some scale it could be the absolute value also so we have no displacement what is it seems to be true yeah so essentially this is we have done that fringe ordering so in one class of problems if you know i don't understand why no option d okay uh, the idea is that we are trying to measure in which case t will be the answer in the case where we go for v displacement we go for the vertical displacement that will be the answer because the grating has to be kept perpendicular to the direction in which you are trying to measure the displacement so d is essentially v displacement for the cantilever beam with an end load and u is the uh, u is option c i hope that is clear yeah so from the grating direction itself you can say that uh, it is giving you uh, displacement that is perpendicular to that direction this is discussed well in the lecture so i hope this is clear no not directly but you will have to observe the problem as it goes about that is to say if i were to start this with uh, a known problem as i said and i try to record the entire patterns that is there let us uh, i say i take a video of this and at that time scale for this load applied what should have been the displacement and what is it the time getting that gives me a means of calibrating same thing apply extrapolated to another this thing uh, uh, to an unknown problem i can number it that way the idea behind fringe ordering is that one uh, there are two things we should know one is the fringe order that is at least at one point in the domain if we know and these are the minimum requirements at least at one point we should know the fringe order fringe order meaning the parameter that is being represented what is the quantitative value of that and then the gradient so if you know one one value and the gradient whether it goes up or down you can number it that way yeah okay so i take it that this is clear okay so we'll move to the next question change in the sum of principal stresses under cyclical or random loading can be obtained directly from which of the following experimental techniques photoelasticity holography thermoelastic thermoelastic stress analysis geometric moire 
yeah sorry sorry change in the sum of principal stresses under cyclical or random loading can be obtained directly from which of the following experimental techniques whether it is photoelasticity holography thermoelastic stress analysis or geometric moire see geometric moire essentially measures displacements and photoelasticity we know it measures principal stress difference so essentially these two cannot be the answer you provided such experiment uh you provided such experiment meaning i didn't quite understand the result was presented in the lecture is that what you mean yeah but that was not from photo easy easy i mentioned as an example easy easy you can measure as minus mu into sigma xx plus sigma yy but that is not something you can measure from photoelasticity that easy easy you may have to measure by strain gauge or some out of plane displacement whatever uh, method that measures out of plane displacement that is how you will have to measure i meant that either holography isopathics from holography and uh, isochromatics from uh, photoelasticity can be clubbed for principal stress separation or if you are not able to apply holography you can apply some other technique by which out of plane strain can be measured and that in conjunction with isochromatics from photoelasticity can give you a via media to separate out principal stresses that easy easy will not be measured by photoelasticity i meant in conjunction so i thought i hope that is clear yeah so essentially uh, what this method implies uh, what this method employs is when we load a model cyclically the temperature variation to the uh, this is a very sensitive technique and this uh, measures about 1000th of a degree the variation so that can be uh, used to uh, that that is calibrated in order to get the principal stress uh, sum that changes so thermoelastic stress analysis is mainly applied for fatigue kind of problems but uh, again the caution being that thermoelastic stress analysis doesn't mean that it measures thermal stress it measures this quantity yeah yeah sorry uh uh there is a little bit of background noise could you speak a little louder or perhaps type it because i'm not able to hear the question clearly atharva yeah no 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 specimen is not externally heated by virtue of the loading cyclical loading there is temperature variation in that which is what is captured and calibrated in order to back calculate what could be the response yeah yes yes uh that depends on what yeah because even our uh, this thing can because 1000 we are talking in terms of 1000th of a degree so the environment also needs to be very much controlled which implies indirectly that it is a very expensive setup it is not for day to day applications it is a very sophisticated and exper uh, expensive setup which will be for special applications for example some component in isro or something space uh, studies things like that they will have a large investments because they the thing needs to be perfect when they send it out so those are the applications where these methods are applied okay anyway uh, let us move to the next problem the given figure represents the fringe patterns obtained from shearing interferometry the fringe contours represent which of the following ideally for uh, like i said that there is a disk 
we take under dimetrial compression because we have the closed form solution for it for planar stresses. Whereas out of plane, if we have to define, we would essentially this will be the go to problem that we will use for calibration because of its symmetry and closed form solution that is available. So essentially what this means is if I were to take a disc and I apply pressure onto it, that is I it is like a, a rounded disc which I apply pressure here and it is clamped around the ends. So if I were to take a section like that, if I were to take a section like that, how is it that I anticipate this to deform? It is clamped at the ends, so slope is zero. And uh, essentially at the center, I again have slope is zero because of the symmetry of the problem. So it would vary something like that. This is the displacement profile like and it is symmetrical. Uh, pardon me if it doesn't look symmetrical, but you can take my word that it is symmetrical for this problem. So essentially this is the displacement out of plane displacement that we are seeing. So what is this? This is W if I were to take this as this as X, this as Y, this displacement is essentially W that is along the Z direction out of plane, which we are trying to cut a section and see. So can this be U displacement? or V displacement or slope or curvature. So ideally for out of plane uh, as we saw that shear interferometry it measures curvature and slopes of out of plane displacement if I were to measure how does the slope change here it goes from 0 it goes somewhat negative then it again goes back to 0 at the center and it is symmetrical. So essentially this is the point of inflection where we see the variation is coming out clearly. So essentially this represents nothing but the slope, slope of the out of plane displacement. This uh, you can uh, look it up from the lecture also, but I am just giving you a another way to think about this. This is obtained experimentally. So it is essentially slope of a clamped circular plate under central loading. So in order to understand this better, what you can do is from any basic course on plates and shells, you can just take up a standard result for a circular plate that is clamped at the ends and apply it uh, with a out of plane load, out of plane uh, concentrated load at the center. You would essentially get the displacement profile as functions of X and Y. You differentiate that once and differentiate that twice and try to plot it. Try to plot it along the diameter. You will get such. Uh, uh, essentially, you would be plotting this. Now, if you just use MATLAB or something, you can just plot out the entire uh, way how the contours are, essentially, how the surface varies. So, uh, and if you were to project it on a surface, on a plane, this is the pattern that you will see. So for those who are interested, you can just try this out once so that uh, you get a hands on understanding of the problem. That is the slope. But the first picture in the above is not clear. First picture, this one you mean? This is a, this is essentially a clamped plate. This, yeah, okay. So this is a clamped plate. We have a plate that is clamped along the ends and at the center I have a uh, load that is applied in the opposite direction to the clamping. So essentially it will deform out of plane. Now if I were to cut a section there and view it sideways, this is the kind of which is exaggerated. This is the kind of displacement profile I will get. Now this displacement profile is along this diameter. Along this diameter. We, uh, we are getting a displacement profile. Now if I were to generate the slope from this displacement profile, it is a trivial thing. I can just observe how the slopes are varying and go about and if I were want the curvature, I have to see how the slopes are changing instead of the displacement. That is the double derivative of the displacement. So I hope that is clear. Yeah. Okay. So let us move on to the next thing.
the term stress slope c yeah. so the term stress analysis in the complete sense encompasses which of the following which all of the following if you in case you did not know this means a multi select single select would be just a button so essentially this could have more than one answers so any ideas about which one it is displacement components exactly so if we were to see stress tensor has nine components out of which only six are independent because of this symmetry of the stress tensor what is the reason for symmetry of the stress tensor any okay stress is a tensor of rank 2 but does uh, does this mean that uh, all second order uh, second rank tensors are symmetric okay so the reason for why stress is a symmetric tensor comes from the balance of angular momentum if we were to see how we develop the equilibrium differential equations of equilibrium we would be seeing that when we apply the uh, conservation of angular momentum we will see that stress tensor comes up yeah uh, that tau xy equality of cross shears it is a consequence of uh, bag, angular momentum balance only so essentially stress tensor is symmetric because of the balance of angular momentum okay is strain tensor symmetric yes and why is that any ideas definition of stress okay definition ah exactly it is by definition of strain because uh, essentially we measure displacements then from there we have gradients of displacement so grad plus grad u transpose half of that is what comes out as strain and the difference of that comes out as rotation tensor or spin tensor as you call it so by definition strain tensor is symmetric and we know that displacement is a vector so it only has three independent components so once we have three independent displacement components u v w and then six strain components i j where i and j varies from 1 to 3 similarly if i have sigma i j where i and j varies from 1 to 3 i have understood the problem completely i have derived all of its components is it possible to get all of these components from any one experimental technique any ideas if we can get all strain components all stress components and all displacement components from a single experimental technique no so the idea is not to say that since uh, as professor also says since a single experimental technique cannot give you all these then it is useless uh, yes combined techniques we will have to apply and those also we will have to apply only when there is a need for it essentially if we are designing some component for stress uh, for, for strength our focus will be on stresses if we are to design that component for stiffness criteria our focus will be on displacements so the idea is if we are going for a design an analysis problem first we have to understand what are the limitations of each and every experimental technique what are the uh, output that the, what is the output that the experimental technique gives and what is it that we are trying to measure it is unlikely it is very rare that we want everything uh, that is solved for this problem for a single problem at hand even if we were to uh, somehow deduce what is it that we want we can conduct experiments only for those quantities and do away with the rest whereas in numerical methods if we were to use finite element method for example all these once you have a model that is validated by some means of experiment 
these things you can trivially get at once at a click of a button you can get it from numerical methods only challenge is that you do not know how you have defined the boundary conditions whether they are correct or not whether it actually captures the phenomena or not so that is the only challenge which requires experimental validation other than that as professor said for uh, parametric analysis there is uh, nothing better than numerical techniques i hope that is clear so i'll move on to the next in which of the following problem a closed form solution from strength of material exists so first we need to understand what is a closed form solution any ideas on what is a closed form solution at all yeah so exactly so if we were to take a mechanical problem yes analytical solution exists uh, analytical solution can also be near field and uh, whole field so that also has a catch so ideally speaking for the entire model domain if you are able to deduce everything then it is a closed form solution for example if you take a crack in fracture mechanics you deal only with near field solutions because the applicability of your analytical solution it breaks down as you go about of uh, extrapolating that for other these things same goes for a uh, for example if you take a cantilever beam and uh, in strength of materials we have studied cantilever beam we even know that the end deflection is pl cube by 3ei but uh, is that a closed form solution it is an approximation that is because we have neglected shear effects there whereas a beam under four point bending for the shear span if we see essentially our uh, all the fibers they are circular when they bend so all our assumptions hold good plane sections do remain plane before and after loading so in that case it is a closed form solution otherwise it is a uh, it is essentially an engineering analysis or a, it has some approximations so if we see from this for a plate subjected to a small hole it is not possible to solve this from strength of materials even theory of elasticity there are certain restrictions only under those restrictions we can apply this solution the restriction being that the hole has to be very very small compared to the lateral dimension of the plate so essentially this we cannot solve using strength of materials circular shaft with subjected to torsion here we can see that if we were to take a shaft and if we were to twist it we'll be able to see that every section does remain straight it does remain plane so our assumption still holds good and this we all have seen the torsion formula for uh, case of uh, pure shear we have been able to derive it and uh, apply it to circular shafts hollow and solid board so essentially we have solved that problem completely thick cylinder subjected to internal pressure so essentially if we see a cylinder some of you may have already circular shaft thick cylinder also has beam under circular shaft okay someone gave an answer i think one minute circular shaft thick cylinder also has yes it is the the question is not whether it has a closed form solution or not uh, the question is whether strength of material provides it or not so essentially thick cylinders would not fall into that category because uh, for that you need to approach it from the stress function uh, approach or the displacement function approach either way uh, which comes under the purview of theory of elasticity which is the next level course rather than the first level course that is strength of material so if you were to see the variation here uh the thickness variation radial stress in the thickness variation is neglected in case of a thin cylinder which is not the which is very pronounced in case of a thick cylinder so the closed form solution for this only exists from theory of elasticity and not from strength of material i hope that is clear okay so based on what all we have discussed now 
which among the following experimental techniques are whole field techniques whole field is the entire domain it will give the parameter value at once so photoelasticity is a whole field technique brittle coating i'll elaborate more on brittle coatings as to what they are strain gauge as someone had also pointed out strain gauge is essentially point by point because it gives you the component of strain that are along its gauge length the component of strain at a particular point where you put it so it is essentially a point by point technique digital image correlation is the relatively newer method but that also has been established for about uh, 10 years or so perhaps more essentially what we do is we take a specimen we put some speckle patterns on it that is uh, we put black and white patterns on it analyze it with the camera and uh, there are softwares there are algorithms which track the movement of each and every this each and every point which would essentially give you in plane displacements for out of plane displacements you would have to use a minimum of two cameras which are placed at an oblique angle this is the very uh, pedestrian understanding of digital image correlation which can which has the capability of measuring either in plane displacements along with in plane out of plane displacements also can be measured if you go for 3d dic brittle coatings so essentially we know something from strength of material that brittle materials fail by anyone any idea okay if i were to take a, let us say a chalk and pull it what would be the failure plane like i'll let me any idea as to which one would it be a or b this being a chalk and i pull it in uniaxial tension chalk yeah so chalk is essentially a brittle material if i were to take a point here or let us say why not take the point here itself if i take a point here at the moment when just before it is about to break if i draw the stress it will be like this so essentially the other direction would be zero because it is subjected to uniaxial tension so essentially it fails in the direction of maximum principal stress in the direction perpendicular to maximum principal stress so that is the idea behind using this is the phenomena that is used in the context of brittle coatings so if i were to have some component and i apply a coating over it a brittle coating over it and if i were to observe later that it forms cracks in some directions so what this essentially telling is at each and every point along the crack i am able to find out what the maximum principal stress direction is because it has cracked in a direction that is perpendicular to that so if we were to use strain gauges what you would find is in order to characterize the uh, in order to populate the entire strain tensor we need six quantities let us say we go only for principal stresses we know if we know the principal stress direction you would have known that there is a strain rosette which we place in three mutually perpendicular directions and then we are able to characterize all the other directions based on this but if you were to a priori know somehow at a point what is the direction of principal stress then you may well align your strain gauges in those two directions so that gives you uh, that saves you one strain gauge per point and if you were to do it for a big component let us say at every point you are able to identify at key points you are able to identify what the principal stress directions are and appropriately align the strain gauges in those directions alone you can easily populate your strain tensor with just two strain gauges instead of three so that gives you an advantage so brittle coating is done to identify which is the direction of principal stress at every point so what we will do is we will apply the coating a uh, brittle coat over a material and then load it as it would be loaded in service and we will observe the cracks at each and every point along the crack we know the per direction perpendicular to it is the maximum principal stress direction in that plane so this is how the concept of brittle coating comes about
and there have been extensive experiments done by professor durelli which uh, uh, professor ramesh has also covered in his lectures where he has indeed shown that principal stress directions are mutually perpendicular from mathematics we might be able to derive it but to see it experimentally reinforces our understanding that we are indeed uh, going in the correct path and this has been shown for uh, ex uh, by experiments for many problems so i hope this is clear so essentially uh, which are whole field here brittle coatings is whole field digital image correlation is whole field strain gauge is not whole field it is point by point so i hope that is clear if there are any questions please do ask okay so i take it that this is clear okay photoelasticity also gives you a whole field uh, view whole field for the entire field it will give you contours of principal stress difference that is isochromatic surface okay the cross section of rails is chosen to be similar to an i section compared to a square section or a rectangle identify the correct statements related to the above notion so you know that i roughly speaking a rail section is like that you will have a bulbous head and a flat flange at the bottom but essentially it's an i section it's a variant of an i section why don't i draw that itself in the meantime those who wish to answer can take a shot at it Uh, essentially because of the support conditions we can see that uh, rails are transmitting bending loads so that is true the inner core does not participate in load sharing uh, neglecting shear effects which is a reasonable approximation for slender beams if we see the strain va strain variation it will be somewhat linear passing through the centroid of that section for the homogeneous section so essentially our uh, stress variation is also linear so our middle core of the material is not taking any that is if i were to take this as a component and uh, i can see that strain variation would be like that which is exactly symmetrical but the central core is not participating so essentially the idea behind this question is uh, it is simple but to understand that uh, bending and axial forces differ in the sense that bending also depends on the distribution of the section distribution of the area so the sum and substance of this is that any area if you any section any design section if you see it can be parameterized into two quantities one being the area one being the moment of inertia the distribution of the area that is what is captured mathematically by moment of area second moment of area essentially so if you were to parameterize this you can make your study for any arbitrary cross section and extrapolate the results based on these two parameters alone so the inner core does not participate the stress does vary linearly and the maximum load occurs at the top or the bottom yes so essentially all the four hold in this case so i hope this is clear this was not uh, as tough a question just that uh, in order to reinforce the understanding such questions were put in before yeah so the information one can directly obtain from the geometric moire experimental technique is r in plane shear stress in plane displacements principal stresses sum of principal stresses out of plane displacements which are the ones that you feel is correct any in and out of plane yeah b and e essentially but both would not be simultaneously obtained for that you will have to put the grating in uh, uh, different orientations or you can uh, have two sensor two optical elements that is capturing the phenomena but essentially in plane displacement and out of plane displacement both can be met. essentially displacement can be measured in the direction perpendicular to the grating so it uh, it is up to you how you place the grating and what is it that you want to study so it can measure displacements
identify the correct statements. In case of contours which represent displacement fields, the fringe order can be both positive or negative. The contours of U. Yeah. The information that you can get from geometric Moire experimental technique is essentially you have to hold the grating and you will get the displacement perpendicular to that grating. So you can hold it at the face or at the side face, you can get in and out of plane displacements. Both are possible to get. Uh, does that answer your question, sir? Uh, does that answer your question? Somebody had asked. Okay, I take it that it is clear. I'll move on to the next problem. Yeah, identify the correct statement. I'm sorry if it is small. I'll just zoom in. In case of contours which represent displacement fields, the fringe order can be positive or negative. The contours of U displacement in case of a beam subjected to pure bending will be in the shape of a parabola. By suitable uh, arrangement of optical components, it is possible to obtain all isoclinics from a single photoelastic experiments. Photoelastic experiment. The total fringe order in photoelasticity is always positive. Compared to the fringes obtained from photoelastic experiments, the fringes from speckle interferometry takes more time to process. I'll just take them one by one. Essentially, if you were to uh, take, let us say, a case of four point bending, and if you were to measure the displacements, you would see that uh, there will be a reversal of displacement as compared from the tension side to the compression side. So the displacement naturally definitely can be positive and negative. There is no uh, a hard and fast rule about that it will be only positive or it will be only negative. So that can be, that is very much true. The contours of U displacement in the case of beam subjected to pure bending will be in the shape of a parabola. So U, if you see, it is nothing but theta Y. So it is varying linearly. So ideally, it is not a parabola. So by suitable arrangement of optical components, it is possible to get all isoclinic fringe patterns from a single experimental image. This actually, for this, there will be more background coming into picture when we will be starting transmission photoelasticity. But this question is framed because professor would have mentioned that during the lecture. Ideally, uh, again, if we were to take the problem of our disk, so we would be seeing that our uh, these things would be varying like this. Our isoclinics will be varying like this. So it will be in steps. But all these cannot be obtained by one single arrangement. Where, why is that is because we use something called an analyzer which we will discuss in much depth when we come to transmission photoelasticity. That has to be kept in one particular position. Let us say the analyzer at kept, is kept at angle beta, then you will only get isoclinics for the contours which represent the angle beta. That is beta will be the angle of principal stress direction along that contour, along that fringe. So if you were to rotate it, it will change. But there is no experimental technique that can have all at once. So this is not essentially possible. The total fringe order in photoelasticity is always positive. As we saw, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is some constant. What this constant is and how it is related that we will see later as we go on to photoelasticity. But ideally speaking, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is the fringe that we are getting. And we have already said I start in the starting of the session, I did mention that we have a naming convention. Sigma 1 is invariably greater than sigma 2, which is invariably greater than sigma 3. That is how we label it. So essentially, if we see this left hand side is always a positive quantity. So total fringe order in photoelasticity is always positive, which is why if you take the photoelastic fringes for a four point bend case, that is a pure bending case, you cannot say the compression side from the tension side, except for subtle clues because of Poisson's effect. If you are not sensitive to that, you cannot distinguish between 
a compression side or a tension side you may as well think that the bending moment was applied either way so that is very uh, hard to distinguish unless there is some thickness variation because of poisson's effect which is actually captured in photoelasticity but it might not be very sensitive for the human eye to per perceive it perhaps by digital image processing we can definitely perceive it so total fringe order is always positive yes compared to the fringes obtained by photoelastic experiment the fringes of speckle interferometry needs more post processing ideally photoelastic fringes yeah, you capture it and you can just use there are many softwares to identify uh, fringe orders uh, uh, the numbering of fringe orders but speckle interferometry as the uh, it's a variation of holography which itself requires lot of uh, it's a cumbersome arrangement and uh, ideally in holography what we do is we split a laser beam one part of it is reflected onto a, a, a let us say a photographic film and the other part is sent on to a model which impinges on the photoelastic film so on the photo uh, sensitive film so once this is captured we will use that same light source we will have to illuminate the thing with the same light source the film with the same light source in order to observe what got captured Uh, speckle interferometry is another uh, variation of that but it is a little easy on the user point of view since it uh, allows the users to uh, carry on with uh, simple ccd cameras rather than very high sophisticated cameras and uh, it can also uh, with lot of post processing it can give you real time imaging also but it definitely requires lot of post processing so it is much cumbersome as compared to photoelastic experiments so this is definitely true so this happens to be the last question so we'll just get started uh, we'll just end it end the session with this so match the images with the information provided so without seeing the options also let us try to do that and uh, since uh, mr uh, atharva or somebody had asked i don't know if he is still around but if he is actually photoelastic patterns look this way this is ideally the pattern for a disc under diametral compression in uh, in specific optics when you take a disc made of photoelastic material and then you compress it by diametral loads essentially these are the fringe patterns that you see and if i were to observe this in some other optical yeah and if we were to observe this in some other optical arrangement we would be able to see that fringes in color also which i can show it in the next class so ideally this is a disc under diametral compression and this we saw from the very symmetry of the problem this is nothing but out of plane displacement i had cut a section here and i had shown that it varies like that so ideally this is nothing but displacement of a the uh, of a circular plate with clamped load the uh, clamped dents and a point load in between if we were to take d option uh, okay someone had mentioned that d is the slope can you tell me which slope it is that is it is do w by do x or do w by do y w being the out of plane displacement this is nothing but w so when w is the out of plane displacement what happens is it uh, since it is a, yeah since it is a function of x and y so we have to go for partial derivatives so there could be two slopes so ideally it is nothing but the variation along this line so it is do w by do y so d is exactly so d is do w by do y and c is we can see that we have been shown a grating so this is nothing but uh, our u displacement since the grating is provided in the vertical direction this is measuring u displacement and this is the u displacement for a problem of a disc under diametral compression the idea is not to just do pattern matching the idea is to enthuse you that uh, once you know because the closed form solution of a disc under diametral compression is very much available from any standard books so you can also try to plot these fringes and match once you do that the retention would be better i don't understand what is c c uh, you can see that uh, we have provided a grating direction which is vertical so essentially they should be measuring horizontal displacements 
but uh, this is discussed in the lecture this uh, happens to be the uh, u displacement for a disk under diametral compression if you see the analytical equations and try to plot it and maybe uh, whatever values you are getting you plot it as a as some kind of a sine wave you will be getting such fringes you can trivially do that in matlab also and try it out i would encourage you to try it out one so that the retention is better i okay yeah once you uh, keep up with the lectures uh th these will be discussed and anyway even after that if you have a doubt please feel free to get back Thirteen, yeah, yeah. This is thirteen, sir. Yeah. Ideally, this is axial member or a truss member, as you call it. this is a beam this is a shaft these three things only we study in strength of materials yeah 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 okay so anyway we have looked at the last question also so i hope that is clear yeah one minute Yes. Yeah, Shubham Singh sir, we were. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Material. Yeah, material needs to be. Uh, see, there are two variants of photoelasticity. Uh, Shubham Singh, uh, Shubham Bapu, I'll come to your uh, question one minute. uh essentially in photoelasticity we have uh, two variants of photoelasticity in fact i would say three variants uh, if we were to have a transparent model that allows light through it then we go for some variant called transmission photoelasticity where we have a light source behind this then we have some optical filters then we have uh, the model that is stressed and we observe it from the other side so that has to be transparent it is essentially polymer of any kind even a simple ruler plastic scales that you have if you see it in a photoelastic polariscope you will be able to see the fringe patterns the stresses that are there now if you were to apply this to a metallic specimen then obviously you cannot place the light source behind this in such a case in such a case you have to go for something called reflection photoelasticity where you have to apply a coat uh, which is strain based transmission photoelasticity is stress based so it depends on which variant you would select that depends uh, very much on the material that is under use yeah yes yes essentially you will be coating the photoelastic uh, material onto the metal piece once you coat it you paint it over it then you impinge and you will be able to see the thing. yeah yeah okay uh uh because it is asking for shear stress let us say that second is the option okay if i take this point ideally what you are what we are saying is if second were the answer my stress is shear stress is varying like this is what you are saying if that be the case top surface happen top and bottom surface we can see that it is a free surface it cannot have any shear so top and bottom surface has to respect that compatibility by equality of cross shears also this is a bending variation and not a shear variation okay uh, shubham bapu sir we had another class from 5 to 6 so we missed mission possible please yeah yeah these pdfs uh, anyway this whatever the thing that i'm writing on uh, it is possible that i might have roughly written something i'll formally i'll properly write it neatly in a legible way and i'll be uploading this uh, on to uh, a folder which will be shared to you through the swayam portal and this video uh, the session which we are conducting right now i'm also recording that and i'll be uploading th those videos also which will be made available to you in due course of time through the swayam portal so you can check it from there 
after referring it back should you have any questions please feel free to get back to me uh for by the way we discussed the first week today but the deadline for the first week and first so yes it will be post assignment uh, only and that is by design i have confirmed it uh, with nptel so that is the way it is so that is why i would encourage you to ask as many uh, questions in the forum also so that it get clear there and whatever uh, remnant doubts are there that i'll try to address it in this session i hope that is clear. yeah uh, what you had asked sir uh, could you please repeat batula uh, rajamanar ebook yeah ebook uh, for ebook you will have to see professor's website but uh, i don't think it is uh, it is meant to be uh, bought by departments but nonetheless you can check his website it will tell you the id as to where you are supposed to contact for that so you can send out a mail for that some online solution something will be there you can just send it there send your query there okay okay so yeah sorry yeah mobile number uh, you first uh, i would suggest that uh, you use the forum first uh, and why i would tell you that it is in the interest that if you are asking in the forums if there are similar uh, questions that are coming up it will it will encourage more people to ask and we can have a productive discussion whereas if it is one to one discussion uh, many might be left out so i would see in a couple of weeks if it is not picking up then i would consider sharing my number but as of now you can consider posting whatever questions you have you can feel free to post it in the forum actually it is prohibited by nptel i guess uh, can you please explain the applications where uh, can you please explain the application techniques where this would be useful and finite element can't be done it is not that it can be done or can't be done the finite element uh, method okay let us say you have a complex problem and then you make a finite element model of that model that you have captured the geometry you have captured now what about the support conditions or the boundary conditions that need to be given that you will have to gauge based on your understanding and experience you will be providing some kind of a support condition for that let us say that you analyze a fixed beam what you see is fixed physically it also allows rotation but you will totally clamp it in finite element method you will say that arrest all the rotations so what that will do is that will shoot up the stresses there whereas in actual practice there is some rotation and the stress pattern is not exactly the same as you are getting in your finite element so finite element although it gives you a flexibility it is very important to validate it by some experimental means once you are confirmed that it captures the physics of your problem then you can go about extrapolating that is the basic essence of the thing i hope i have clarified it mr surya prakash okay yes fem should be validated by experiments exactly okay so if there are any other questions you please uh, feel free to ask or you can also consider posting it in the forum actually two hour session i also feel it's a little long but uh, it's okay we have managed to come this far so we'll go with this and uh, to make this uh, make the most out of this session i would encourage you to please uh, ask and post your questions in the forum so that through the course of the week also i can have a look at them and then discuss them uh, more effectively in these sessions so i would encourage uh, you to please join the forum and ask so that uh, this initiative uh, it helps out the students and i hope i have done justice to your questions in case there are any remnant doubts you please feel free to get back to me so thank you uh, so if there are any other uh, questions if there are no other questions i would like to call it a day and i'll see you next monday at 6 o'clock using the same link this will be the same link for the entire duration of the course yeah yeah thank you thank you rafael thank you your session was very informative okay thank you very much for the feedback okay thanks then i'll see you guys next week thanks thank you okay then i'll end the call thanks